Okay, I have started streaming. Do not say the N-word. I'm not going to say the N-word. Why do you feel the need to say that? Just as a precaution. Anyway. <laughs> Why is it always that? It's like never anything else. Like of all the horrible shit you've heard me say before, that has nothing to do with racial slurs. Oh yeah, don't say the N-word specifically. It's just the word of the day. I, God, I sure hope not. Anyways, I guess people are going to be really happy that I'm streaming Live for Speed. Uh, I guess I should run in a borderless window, but beggars can't be choosers. Anyway, for those watching, welcome to me trying out Live for Speed, I guess. I still haven't fixed the issue of not being able to stream in 21 by 9 But yes, I've owned Live for Speed for a long time. I used to race it back in 2010. 4chan had a... I think a trial or a free server, we used to bomb around in the Formula BMW at Blackwood, met a lot of people on there, uh, really comfy server to just mess around in, and yeah, so I do have an S3 license, and people in my comment section have been like, Austin, what do you think of Live for Speed? I I'm indifferent to it, but obviously I saw that they have mod support now, there's an in-game 3D car modeler, so you can, you don't even have to rip models from other games, guys can just build a car in the game itself, which is kind of neat, and then do all the physics for it and stuff like that, so yeah, people have made some cool shit for it, there's like a Formula E car, uh, there's like a 60s F1 car, a 70s F1 car, uh, Ted, you might need to get this, it actually allows, when you buy a license, it allows other people to unlock the game, You just, if they use your login, and I think I have like four free logins. So you could just download this one day and fuck around with it. Hmm. Uh, to be honest, I'm enjoying the 70s uh, the seventies F1 stuff in, in AMS2 way too much right now compared to anything else. Yeah, because AMS2 actually has content unlike this game, which has like eight fantasy tracks, seven fantasy tracks, and the Rockingham Oval. And then one mm -hmm. of them is an autocross track. It's, yeah, there's not a lot to do in this game. This is very, this game came out in 2003. So it was right on the cusp of, like, sim racing becoming this big thing. And it really, the history of LFS, I'm kind of shaky on it, but it kind of represents what Assetto Corsa did in 2013, where this random indie developer came out of the woodwork and basically said, we think we know how a tire behaves in a race car better than anyone else, so we're just going to make our own little tech demo of a game with, like, a handful of cars and a handful of tracks, but it's going to drive so amazing that you won't care that it doesn't look the greatest or it has a bunch of unlicensed content. So, yeah. That's kind of where we're at now. So, as you guys can see on the stream, uh, this is the very bare bones menu. The menu system is somewhat clunky, I gotta admit. Not a huge fan of it. Uh, but you click mods. Obviously, here's all the stuff I have installed. I just went through the list. And you can look at all the uh, shit that's been made for this game. Someone's made, like, a modern F1 car as well, Formula E stuff, a soccer ball, uh, a 2003 stock car, which, honestly, I've driven it. It's not very good, which is might be a theme of today's episode. You can go either approved mods only or just show all mods. You can sort by date, name, or rating. You can search by name. And, yeah, people are slowly starting to make stuff. Someone's made, like, a rough CTR Yellowbird. Kind of neat. Uh, people have made a lawnmower tractor. Uh, a 1930s Grand Prix car. All the pictures are loading in here. Ooh, a Mazda... What is that, an RX-7 GTO? That's pretty neat. Kinda, yeah, it looks like it. That's Ooh. pretty fucking cool. Uh, nobody, nobody's done the 924 IMSA GTO car. I think that'd be a real cool one for somebody to do. The 924? Which one's that? Uh, it was the precursor to the Porsche 944. It was just the earlier model, but I think they ran okay. it into GTO. There was a, a Porsche factory team, um, kind of like, I think it was like in the, like the, the early to mid eighties back when, um, Scott, what's his face from Grand Am Scott Rolex, Pruitt. you know, remember? Yeah. Scott Pruitt was a factory Porsche driver back then. Uh, he raced that in IMSA GTO, um, or just IMSA GT. I think it was at the time. This was after GTO. Uh, they had like a turbo, a turbo portion 924. It was pretty fucking awesome. 
cool looking car. They actually still make reproduction fiberglass body kits that are meant to mimic that car that people put on like uh like SCCA E production, Porsche nine four fours and nine two fours. That's kinda neat. Yeah. What the fuck is this? A pocket XR? So he like downscaled an existing car and then put like a fake cage around it. It's kind of neat. They are curating the mod list, so you can't just rip like entire seasons of a game and put it on the on the marketplace. You have to change a little bit of stuff, and uh, you have to change its name. But it looks like there's already been like a lot of shit that's been made for this game. Red Cow based. Um, seems to be like a knockoff Fiat supercar. Don't know what the fuck this is. Like a rallycross car, I guess. Looks like it. Yeah. Some Early '90s movie. open wheel, which is what I'm gonna drive. Uh. Incorrect opinion and taste. But okay. Yes. XRT rally car. What is this like? Early '80s Group C. Mm. Before it got completely out of control. Yeah, it kind of looks like a maybe like yeah. an Opal Manta clone. Okay. Opal Manta or like an FC RX7. There's a KV2 heavy tank, okay. Yeah, and downloading them takes seconds, which is crazy. Like, when I click on these, it downloads them to my game. It's really small car files and just everything. Which is really efficient, because compared to AC, where you're downloading, like, sometimes gigabytes worth of cars and skins... Hey, I had one of those cozy car growing up. Uh, McLaren from back in the day. I still, I still wish that more Sims had the um, something like Content Manager where you can run the sim in the background and then choose what to launch directly instead of having yep. to boot full into the launcher. Especially if you're in VR like I am, it just makes running the sim so much less of a pain in the ass. I'm pretty sure LFS works in VR. Tesla Cybertruck, top fuel dragster. Uh, I I'm triggered. It's not a very good car model. Uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, off road buggy. There is rally cross in this game. From what I recall, the loose surface physics are pretty good. Uh, more bikes. Seems to be a lot of bikes in this game. Santa sleigh. Not touching that. Definitely touching the 2004 Toyota Corolla. A flat, uh, earth-shattering 130 brake horsepower. I mean, 130 actually really isn't that bad, if you think about it. The thing is, like, the Ecotex put out, like, 150 to 170 in, in like, the Sunfires and Cavaliers. Mm -hmm. And you can throw cams in a lot of yep. the small inline four engines and free them up a lot when you yep. cut the catalytic converter off of them, because the only reason they don't make more power is pretty much emissions control. Yep. So that's everything in the game so far. A really diverse set of shit, like light commercial trucks. So already this game has a pretty good mod scene, which is really promising. Uh, Formula E. Again, I, I've got that already. Uh, not a lot of liveries people have made. Shout out to Save On Foods. Holy shit. Fuck, I haven't shopped at Save On in ages. We, I don't really have one by my house. Yeah, some, some pretty cool stuff uh, is, that is being like made. A, is that just like a food place from a third world country? No, it's... We have... Canada has a lot of weird, like, off-brand, but very large grocery store change, chains. Like, we have... Safeway's been pretty popular in the West, like, all across Western North America. But, like, we have, like, Save on Foods. We have No Frills, which is, like, an offshoot of Superstore. And Superstore itself is something I don't think the States has. So this kind of shows you the jankiness of, of AMS... Or not AMS, sorry. <laughs> At that point, that that comment is now, like, muscle yeah, memory. Yeah, so we're still... We've got, like, fucking Stockholm Syndrome from playing so much <laughs> AMS2 recently. I, I made myself sick doing carding with, hit, with Austin and AMS2 last night. Fucking sicker than a dog. It made me so ill. I really wish I could rename some of these mods so I know what they are. Because, like, what the fuck... I, I mean, what's a P126, you know? But anyway, that's how you pick cars. It's, a, it's probably like a prototype P1 class car, yeah. version 26, whatever. Comes and then, oh, it's a 60s F1 car. Oops, right? Like. Oh. oh, you know what? I bet you it's based on a BRM. Okay. That's how BRM normally classified their cars. Here, let me look it up right now. Yep, BRM P126, which is a Formula 1 racing car from 1968 okay. to 1969. This is the famous one that had the 16-cylinder H layout engine in it. 
the really fucking weird huge engine that was super overcomplicated but really nutty powerful. Okay. That they they put in the Lotus Forty Nine and then decided they hated and swapped for the Cosworth, which is what then became the Lotus Forty Nine. Let me check. Let me check this out. Let me not check out the Tumblr posts about the car and actually look at something respectable. So here is the Indy car I'm going to be messing around with. Uh, you get two configs. Uh, you get an oval track config with the tiny speedway wings. Uh, which is really only good for Rockingham and I think the Kyoto ring. Then you get the, the road course variant, which is, you know, your standard high downforce stuff. Slightly different boost. Uh, how much power we put into the ground? 720? That's pretty cool. Uh, honestly, I really should just drive this off the bat. There's not a lot of setup options, which I actually don't mind in this game. Uh, because I feel like once you start getting into slow and fast bump and third springs and stuff like that, that's where a lot of people in sim racing get lost. So, the good news is, downforce is really just like, here's your wing angle, tires, it's, here's your, your pressure in your camber, uh, you do have your basic diff settings, your completely adjustable gear settings, although, like, first of all, you have to make a new setup for them, and incrementally, it's kind of a pain in the ass, you'll see why in a bit, but I'll just run default for now, uh, steering, some stuff, some settings are in different menus than what you'd expect in, like, R-Factor. Uh, suspension settings, again, you just have bump and rebound, anti-roll bars, ride height. Actually, you know, the more I flip through this, the more I'm a fan of, like, this is just, this is really all the set of stuff you need. Because, I, I mean, we've talked about this in our, uh, in our podcast, and I've talked about Billy Strange with it as well. Some games actually give you too many setup options, especially iRacing's notorious for it, where they give you stuff to adjust that is, like, stuff you would adjust when building the car that you couldn't really adjust at the track. If that makes sense. Like stuff like on a tube frame car, yeah. like twist rate and shit like that. Or wild stuff like pre preflexing the chassis and things like that. We would have to get Billy Strange in here, but I know it was one of the main comments he made when testing iRacing's dirt stuff back when they first released it. He's like, when I would make setup adjustments, uh, like there would be stuff that it was like, that's what you do in the garage in the off season. And, like, should bake into the car. Anyway. It goes against my own personal code of conduct. But I will run the default set at West Hill National. Again, not a whole lot of tracks in this game. You get Blackwood, which is the track everyone knows from the demo version. Cell City, I think, has really good layouts. Uh, generally quite well designed. There's a lot of, like, really nice looking and nicely designed tracks in this game. You might like this, Ted. Uh, Kyoto Ring is kind of like a fake, uh, what's it called? Not Fuji Speedway. Twin Ring Motegi. Uh, but it's shaped a bit different, and there's a much more elaborate road course on the outside. Yeah. West Hill is more of like a tr traditional. It kind of reminds me, reminds me of Barber. Like I cheated. I did some practice laps earlier to know the layout. It's Barber, but not Barber. Yeah. Uh, Aston is another kind of European-ish circuit. Then you have Rockingham, which is the Rockingham Oval in the UK that was built for kart racing that never came. And then, I don't know what the fuck layout square is. Anyway, we'll go to West Hill, because that's what I turned some laps on. It's basically Barber. So, again, the menu is not not the greatest. It's very, it's very modular. And this is the game. Instant load, load times, which is pretty incredible. Uh, you can change how much your driver looks to the left or right, which I really like. Uh, before we get going... How do I turn on uh, heads-up display and cockpit view? Let's find this. So there's tons of different, like, in-car shit here. Yeah, and it's it's kind of kind of ugly, but... Like, all the, all the, like, seat position stuff is right in this pause menu. But, like, it does in very small increments. Uh, so I've done all that. Uh, acceleration shifts viewpoint. You can adjust mirrors. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I want I want the uh, heads up display in the dash. How do I do that? But the FPS is getting CS:GO numbers. Got to turn ray tracing on. Yeah, this game runs incredible. Like, there's no issue with the frame rate at all. 
Virtual steer engage, people want that. Show pedals, yes. Oh, car shut off on me. Message text size, crank that up. Oh my god, I'm getting 500 FPS on Counter-Strike Source. Wow, it's like, yeah, if you don't get good FPS on this game, something is wrong. Uh, maximum frame rate, 100. Uh, I'm seeing people recommend view clocks mode. Somebody called you casual for wanting the HUD in the cockpit. Maybe it's a view clocks button. Clocks mode. Uh, all, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Maestro. Oh, Jesus. That is a, a rough looking heads up display, but it's LFS. A lot, of, a lot of this stuff can be forgiven. Uh. Most of the stuff you admittedly don't need to adjust, which is really nice. Gear shift debounce, I believe this is so. Uh, if you have an issue with the the shifting pedal paddle sticking, and it'll accidentally shift up twice, you can change that. AI use player setup. Uh, that's interesting. We turn that on. AI use player colors. Yep, we turn that on. Rest seems okay, so let's fire this thing up, which we can't because the car turned off. I button has turned it on. Speed limiter is on by default. And welcome to West Hill. Sounds not the greatest. Visually, I think the track detail is pretty good. The initial thoughts, the car feels nice and weighty. Now LFS, the tire model, you do have to baby it a bit on your first lap or two. I'd rather that than the opposite. That, yeah. That's a little bit more accurate, uh, especially with how hard these tires are going to be on something like this and how big they are. The slip angle curve will be really small. Didn't like when I did that, that's for sure. So, first issue, uh, this car has six gears. Default set has a terrible final drive ratio. But we'll make do with it for now before we start messing with shit. What well, compelled to pull you, uh, for you to pull this out of the annals or whatever? Uh, they recently got mod support, like within the past month or two. So like this indie car is brand new to the game. Oh my god, it's gonna like die in through there. Let's try and get some more heat in the tires, cause that's. It's not driving as comfy as it looks. It's definitely not bad, though.
Oh my god, what the fuck? Dude, I, it's trying to kill me at 100k. That would probably be pretty slippery at low speed when the downforce is turned off. Especially if it's got that weird stuff where they don't have the, the diff coast anywhere near locked enough. Like we've run into with a lot of these open wheel cars on the default set. Yeah, I'll have to check after a few laps here. I want to put like one good benchmark lap in. But like you'd think a car could handle being driven at 60k, like that's highway speeds, you know? Yeah. Because there's that one, like, double right-hander where it was just like... It's like I hit a patch of black ice. Well, it also looked like the it was starting to camber in a little bit and then also dipped downhill, so it was been that the inner wheel got off the ground. Yeah. Could be an elevation change thing. I don't know. So this complex right here, just spooky. Pretty fun looking, actually. I wish we had anything that technical than the other tracks around me. Gotta get my ass out of Minnesota ASAP. Like the fact that they've got Avon tires because it's an actual real racing tire brand, but I think they, they either only do vintage tires or, or they've been out of business for so long that like their license has expired, I'm pretty sure. So you remember seeing them on like seeing them on like old 70s Lolos and shit like that. Somebody in the chat saying 30 co 60 power with no preload is appropriate for like a Lola chassis to car car of the air. Oh, from, uh, from from Richard. He goes by Sky, but it's Richard. Yeah. Okay, we'll run that then. That sounds, that sounds about right for what I think. Avon Tires still exists. Cool, so Avon Tires is officially longer lasting than my father. <laughs> I like it. Wow. Yeah, mid corner at like low speeds. Yeah. Like the oh shit. Oh uh, yeah. See, I'm just like a tiny bit behind you. I just saw that. It's like this drive's so weird. It's like the good parts of AC, but the bad parts of I racing. So just yeah, kind of what the fuck? I didn't think I did anything wrong there. It feels like you have just a ton of grip, and then like right at 100k, it's just all gone. Well, a car, a car like this would get really slippery at most points like that. Like, don't forget, like, yep. 90s is pretty much vintage now, right? Like, it's hard to think about, but this is a 30-year-old car. The downforce would not be working at that low of speed at all, right? <sighs> it, it, I mean, the downforce shouldn't, but, like, the tire should be sticky, too, you know? No, no, I, I get it. But you might be on the oval tires or something on the by default, because don't forget, you're basically, it seems like you've got an oval gear ratio on it, right? So maybe you've got, like, the really hard tires on it that they wouldn't be using at the road course? Question maybe. Right? We'll, we'll, we'll check. Oh my god, what the fuck? See, I don't know what I did there. Clearly a skill issue. <laughs> yeah, it's time to mess with a bit with the setup, Richard's right. Yeah, I uh, got to it. I'm not entirely sure what you did either. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like, maybe it models the curbs are just ultra-slippy, which is a thing, it but be fairly slippery. It, it felt like the moment, it didn't even felt like I went over the, like, the slip angle limit. No, it looked pretty snappy. Yeah. And it was just I'm super guessing, unexpected. I'm guessing it probably got oval downforce and stuff like that on it by default. That's honestly well, right. I'm running the road track preset, so we'll look at the downforce, max downforce. Maybe, I mean, maybe it could have been bottoming out, but let's make a new setup. So, call this road two. Also, people are saying I'm very quiet compared to you on the stream. That's not good. I can fuck Turn with up. that. 
your team speak or Discord call about 10 decibels and lower your mic about the same in OBS, and we should be able to hear Ted and you without you sounding three times louder, according to John C. Okay, let's fuck with that. So you've been boosted, and then... Try talking? <laughs> hey, that, that, looks, that looks pretty good. Hello. <laughs> that, yep, that might be I'm okay. About to, I'm about to start a business called Cake Takers. We're here to take your cake, and you'll have no say. If you're trying not to break your diet, you call us, and we'll get that cake right out of there. Presets in YouTube section are far better. Yeah, let's do that. So, uh, Richard says it's better. Uh, final drive. So, no preload. 30 power, 60 coast. That was actually what Richard recommended. So, that's default. Okay. So, that's not good. Uh, colors. Don't care. Brakes. I thought the brakes were fine. The brakes were probably the best part of the car, honestly. Didn't feel the need to change them. Uh, downforce. I mean... Oh, wow. You can even test like the speed and get like a readout that's kind of neat I'd kind of like the speed to be in you know not meters a second oh oh you're saying Richard's saying it should be the other way around uh 60 power 30 coast yeah okay but with no preload or pre-ramp. Yeah, now you can choose differential type, open diff, locked diff, clutch pack, limited slip. Steering. Uh, I didn't think tow was too bad, but usually I run like, in any sort of MR car, I run a lot more tow. I don't know if if you uh, agree that's, with that's that or not. Probably, that's probably not a horrible idea because you can get the back of the car. Yep. <coughs> with mid-engine cars, the the problem with with all um, mid-rear engine and rear-rear engine cars is basically that the engine being in the back acts like a pendulum, right? So it's very easy to overdrive the rear tires on entry. That's why when you see students on track days go too deep into a corner in like a front engine. <laughs> Yep. Rear-wheel drive car, they normally understeer off, but if you see somebody go into a corner too deep in a mid-engine rear-wheel rear, rear drive car, they normally spin towards the inside, right? Because the weight just kind of drags the car around as the rear tires lose grip. Yep. So having a little bit more tow to keep the car stabilized when you've got your hands neutral and you're, you've come through your brake release um, will definitely, definitely help with that. Uh, whether or not it's the best idea, I don't know. Also, there is like a low-powered car versus a high-powered car kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Caster, I honestly don't know what to run for Caster. I usually don't have the value that high. But I, I honestly don't know a whole lot of what caster is. Uh, final drive. So I played around with this earlier. I believe 5.5 is ideal. And uh, you're about to see the issue with, with the sliders in this. They go up by a thousandth. So you have to click and drag and then fine tune. Oh, hey Tyler. We could do something crazy tonight, Tyler, where you could stream on my YouTube channel and I could commentate and you'd you'd have a shitload of viewers. We should fuck around with that after. Sounds like Ted is in a room with concrete walls. I mean I'm not though. I've got my ni I've got my ni my nice sound dampening panels with like R16 insulation in them and canvas stretched over them and everything. Okay, so steering I thought steering was fine. We'll run a bit more tow in the rear. Uh, the suspension. I feel like it's too stiff overall. Mm. 
rear bar will dial out to like 30. Oh, the echo's gone. Oh, it's Talladega week. That might be interesting. Yeah, let's let's do that a little later. I'll, I'll stream some IndyCar for a bit, then I'll take a break, and then I'll jump on Discord and I'll show you how to set it up because that'll be that'll be interesting. Uh, okay. So setup saved. We are in the pits. Gear ratio has been changed. Let's roll. Trying not to push because the tires are cold. Clearly a skill issue. It don't look bad at all. I don't want to make any judgments yet because cold tires. I, I think it should understeer a little more than it currently does. Because cold tires, it's super easy to overdrive fronts in real life. and Yeah. This seems like it's already wanting to rotate. Depends on the kind of car and stuff like that, too. Because you'll get in weird situations where, depending on the type of tire you're running, it just never temps, ever. So... It, it's... You almost get... <sighs> There's some tires, normally only really hard ones uh, in real life, where you get the eye racing effect of the tires yeah. only being fast when they're like brand new. Yep. Like the the Toyo RR, um, which is the the tire for uh, Porsche Spec 944 and NASA, and I think also BMW Spec E30, is really really notorious for that. Like the tires are fastest when brand new, even though they're designed. But but once you've cycled them in once or twice, they literally lose no pace until they're all the way down at the courts. It's like they're only fast when they're brand new, and then they're like a second lap off for like the remaining 10 yep. runs on, on the tire that you can put on them. And you can put like two or three hours on the tire. It's weird. Okay, I have really good news. Uh, the toe and Richard's inverted diff settings are like perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to kill me anymore. I'm, I'm st still feeling that like cunt hair of nervousness. But when I get on the throttle, I'm not scared anymore. It looks a little bit more locked up for sure. Yeah, that's way better, especially over the crest on the downhill. Because now you're actually able to get the diff locked up when accelerating on the way out. Yep. To counter it if it's if it's in a backslide coming in. One twenty two. So I already picked up two seconds from the default setup just by making, you know, like a change. Classic. Holy fuck. Okay. Don't do that. I can probably take turn one flat out, and most of sector one flat out. So let's try that. Nope. Don't do that.
Yeah, I didn't seem to like that very much. Didn't like that elevation change either. No, not at all. It's kind of doing the opposite of what Madness Engine stuff does. You know how we talk about when the car goes over a crest, it like grips up? Yeah. Too quickly? It's like it unloads too quickly over elevation changes. Uh, I don't know, because those elevation changes in Sector 1 seem pretty extreme to me. I don't think that that's entirely inaccurate. Okay. It's hard to say. I'd have to drive it, too, to let you know how it feels, but... Uh... It just like like I'm just trying to think about it. Like if I'm going 140 miles an hour over a crest, that that downslope after that fast left hander in sector one looks like it has almost like post corkscrew levels of down uh, of downhill grade, right? But you're going like 120 miles an hour, 140 miles an hour through there. I would expect the car, even with a lot of downforce, to get super light over that. You know? Okay. It looks pretty. It looks pretty big to me. Yeah, that was a much better turn one. Yeah, that turn one's basically just barely a lift or a tap. And here it gets loose and almost unloads, but there it didn't, so I don't know what's going on. Did you keep more throttle down that time? A little bit. Yeah, that's that's the answer. Because don't forget, on a lot of those decompressing corners, if you if you lift the throttle, you're more likely to experience oversteer than if you keep it pinned because you're shifting the weight balance yeah. forward. So as the front comes over the crest first, the back gets more light than the front, right? Because it's behind the front of the car, so it's still cresting while the front is down. So if you lift over a crest, the tendency is for the car to then snap spin, right? So there's that thing where some of those corners, the more aggressive driving style is actually safer because you're balancing the car out a little bit better. Okay, that's good to know. Also, also very common to be a thing in cars with, like, semi-trailing arm rear suspension where the rear suspension geometry moves around a ton. Like, um... Like, you don't want to coast in a 60s F1 car that has tube rear control, uh, tube, tube rear trailing arms instead of, like, control arms, right? Okay. Because the rear suspension is literally moving back and forth, so if you're rolling through the center of the corner, um it starts to just kind of work wide on you. Gen 1 and Gen 2 Ford Spec Racer cars do that really bad. You want the throttle always on. Uh, the, the early Mark Fuck Honda me. S2000s were notorious for that. Oh, they I almost really, saved it. They really, really... Ooh, I think I'm just getting the when it starts to get bad. Yeah, yeah and then I was I was a retard and went on the grass. Classic. Classic all gong all gong key gameplay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think the only thing I need left to do is suspension. Uh, oh, that's an issue. I don't like the rear end coming up. Yeah, me too, neither. That's, that's a, uh, that's a cheater setup adjustment, like, for the guys watching who don't fuck with setups a whole lot. If you don't like the car getting loose on you on corner exit, lower the rear rebound so it's a smaller value than whatever the bump is. And that's that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it's something you do in oval racing if the car's loose on exit. And you're like, why the fuck is this happening? Or it seems to like unload really quickly on you. Reduce left rear re rebound. It's not like an instant fix, but it is at the same time. Like you're, you're definitely better off diagnosing the problem like thoroughly. So over the course of a run, you don't get weird hand handling characteristics, but like... It's something you can just fuck with and be like, I don't want to deal with this, it's a 20 minute race, that sort of thing. <laughs> Mr. David Land is here. God damn, everyone's showing up. We have we have like all kinds of like little e-celebrities popping in the last few days. We have like the dude that used to write for that mag who knew you. We had like Marcel yeah. Offerman's in here. <laughs> yeah, uh, Matthew Wisinski, I think, yeah. from uh, North American Sports Car just dropped in. Like, oh, is that Ted from Pirelli World Challenge Touring Car B? And I'm like, what the fuck? People remember me? Yeah, this is crazy. This is nutty. So, I think it's too stiff. Well, um, I have nothing uh, adult to say to that. Okay. So, typically what you do with open wheel stuff is you stiffen the shit out of the front, and then the rear, not so stiff. Uh... <sighs> 
I've seen... Okay, so this is something I'm not sure of myself. I, I've seen two, two schools of thought. Which is either you make the front way more stiff than the back on an open wheel car, so that it intentionally understeers, so that the rear, the, the the engine being in the middle of the back doesn't have that pendulum effect we talked about. Yep. Or I've seen the school of thought that you distribute the spring rate based on the weight balance of the car. I've so heard that too. Like, yeah, that's what my buddy Ethan does for like GT stuff. Yeah, and 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 normally the latter one seems to work a little bit better, just because physics wise it helps keep the car more neutral. Um, kind of through the whole corner, but I can see if you're driving around a bad handling issue, the inverse also working. Okay. But it seems to me like a like I don't know, like it might be a little bit more of a crutch versus actually distributing the spring rate and the stiffness of the suspension based on the weight distribution. Because then ideally you're getting all four corners of the car working through the through through the whole corner a little bit better if there's more rear weight and the springs are stiffer than you know, the weight's going to transfer to the front the way it should. The weight's going to transfer to the back the way it should. When you accelerate, the back isn't going to squat too much. When you brake, the back isn't going to decompress too much, right? Yeah. Um, I can kind of see both arguments. I've screwed around with it and had it work both ways before. Here we go. Um, it, it, very Richard, hard to say. Richard answered this. So with big arrow, you want to have the front stiff because of pitch sensitivity. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So that's that's why when Ethan runs like let's say a uh, MR McLaren GT car, he'll do the the springs based on weight distribution. But then like if you look at some of the esports setups for like Cody's F1 games, it's just like super stiff front, super soft rear. Yeah, that kind of that kind of yeah. makes sense. I yeah. guess if you're driving the car for the wings, it makes more sense. But my my stupid, filthy, no downforce touring car brain just can't get over the idea of a car not naturally having a flat platform at speed. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think best time so far is like a 122 I saw pop up. Mm. So we'll try this. I fucked with the gears a bit because I wanted to top out in sixth. So I stiffened the front springs, but I took down the uh, front sway bar, because typically what you do to the springs, you do to the inverse of the front bar. Once these tires heat up, this is going to fly. Yeah. This feels really good right off the bat. I'm happy for you. Knowing that you're having fun with the car setup is almost as good as having fun myself. Looks really good for a 20-year-old game. Yeah, 100%. Like the shading in particular too. It look it it looks pretty par for the course for something like GTR two or or R Factor or or something akin to that. In in my imho in my opinion, so it looks better than R Factor two. Man, that game looks shit, especially in VR. It runs horrible too. Very disappointed in how R Factor two runs. That was a crazy quick sector one. Yes, it was definitely looks like it's heaving a little bit less for you over that crest now. You worried about the low speed handling because of the spring split, but if you're setting the car up just to drive off the downforce and feel like it's kind of a compromise you're going to have to make. I picked up two seconds in sector two. Classic. This game does have dynamic tracks too, hey? Mm. Like it rubbers in where you drive. Wasn't AMS2 doing that last night on the carts? I thought I fiz I thought I visually noticed it taking rubber some places. Uh, I think so. 
was really fun. I'm sad that that made me feel sick. That was super fun. It was a sexy save, but there goes the lap. So it, the bump, or no, the rebound settings fix the unloading, but now I'm driving it way harder because I'm like, oh, I can get away with a lot more. Yeah. And I'm getting in just as, just as retarded situations. <laughs> yeah, but now it's your fault. Definitely overdriving the front tire is pretty bad, it seems like. Okay, let's go for a max attack lap just to see what we can get away with now. I'm in the 121, so... Live for speed, clearly the worst sim because it doesn't have the R factor. You just did a 120.149. That was surprisingly bang on. Uh, that was work. It doesn't like being slower. overdriven like that. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. Yeah, you were overdriving the fuck out of the car. Yep. And it was. I made like five crazy saves that lap, but I was fucking losing crazy amounts of time too. Uh, shit. Uh, oh, you know what? No, here we go. That probably deserved to be fixed. I don't know why I didn't change the front shocks at all. That was a 122.855. Five. I wonder if this game is like AC where... You can get away with, like, not a whole lot of camber. Because, you know, anytime we run, like, Caverick Stramaganza, it's like, yeah. hey, you don't need a whole lot, you know? Yeah. Depends on the car. The you could change tire run. manufacturer. Ooh. Maybe it's, you know what, maybe it's just, uh... I, I don't wonder if you aren't on the oval racing tire style. No, I'm, I'm being serious. we're not. If you look at the tire compound names, it's just road, yeah. super, slicks. Yeah, okay. Definitely seems to reward being smooth rather than aggressive. Yeah, I noticed that too. Like, that last lap was me trying to drive it like an ISI sim. Most most cars like that in real life are actually going to be like that too, because don't forget, the wider the tire gets, the lower the slip angle tolerant gets, right? Okay. Because when you turn the wheel on a tire that's like 15, just extreme exaggeration, a tire that's like 15 inches wide, like those huge fat indie car rear tires are probably like 10 inch or 12 inch rear tires width wise, right? Yeah. You get like a huge 10 or 12 inch wide rear tire versus like a five inch wide rear tire on your street car. If you think about it, if you turn the wheel 10 degrees, the difference between where you're pointing it and the inside and outside edge of the tire is actually greater, correct? Yep. 
which is why these faster high downforce cars with these fat tires, you notice the drivers using very, very little input because it's so much easier to overwhelm the tires. Like, I mean, fuck you watch. Like, I, I got in, a, in a, this stupidest argument on the, on the, the high performance driving uh, instructor's Facebook page with this weird guy a couple of months ago who was like, I can't believe that George Russell, when George Russell like made like qualifying three in the Williams and Silverstone, he was like, I can't, he's, he must, he must be under driving the car. Look, he's using so little input and he's not micro correcting his wheel. And I'm like, how do you think he went that fast by having perfect inputs and not having to second guess his controls, right? And this guy was like, well, I check my laps with a data logger and I'm making micro inputs on the steer wheel. I, I always load the car to the G limit in every corner. I'm like, do you not think that someone like you or me who's a track day instructor might not be as fast as like an F1 driver? Maybe. Like, come on, man. It was just the weirdest conversation. And it's like, of course he's not overdriving the shit out of an F1 car. It's a modern F1 car on modern Pirellis that are good for like half a lap in qualifying. Like he's intentionally loading the car just perfectly and not slipping or doing anything unnecessary. That's that's that is the modern racing and driving style. Is is, is it's trending towards that perfection of always having the tire loaded up just enough and neither overdriving it nor underdriving it, right? The, the faster somebody goes, the faster somebody goes, the less work they're going to appear like they're doing in the car. This this idea, and especially you guys in the chat, you know, I, maybe you're not like this, but if you have friends who are new to the simulator and they just think, oh, I just got to fucking drive the car like, like fast and furious and throw the car around. That's not how a race car driver drives. It's just not, you know? Um... <laughs> I have good news, even though I threw the lap away. Yeah. Camber was the final fix. Good. Glad. I just threw in what I was running on the URD Indy car in AC. Classic. And it was like instant stability. Like sector one, I can probably fly through here. Then I got carried away, but or no, I drove on the grass. Yeah, one twenty-three, but I. Almost spun, so let's try this again. Oh yeah, turn one is like a piece of cake now. Holy fuck. That's funny, more people have picked up on that. Yeah, it is. Pretty good. It's nice to see. Isn't Lift for Speed an online based sim like iRacing? I'm not going to no. lie. I, I don't think so, but I don't have any idea because it's not really in my retinue of simulation softwares that I use. Okay, didn't like me doing that. Uh, this is much quicker. I wonder if ride height's an issue. So I'll go up 30 on each. Yeah. 
You asked because GP Lap said that in his video on the mods for Live for Speed. Yeah, I think what's going on with Live for Speed is that the mods, basically the developers of the simulation software, gave out a content development kit to trusting trusted modders, so modders could basically make air quotes official mods to be included in the game content or available to download. So they vet what's being made for the game a little bit more. But it is not a fully online simulator like something like an iRacing is. Um, it's just a kind of more like an uh, it's like an it's ISI like open. Yeah, yeah it, it's more like an AC with modding. But the mods are like officially approved by the developers, if that makes sense. Uh, to, to, this is now like the second or third person who asked in chat who's talking with Austin. I'm Ted. I'm Ted Ho. Uh, I am a Motorsport Safety Foundation certified racing instructor and an ex-pro race car driver from the United States. I drove in Pirelli World Challenge for two seasons. I had a bunch of Legends cars on dirt ovals and stuff like that. Uh, I'm the co-host of his podcast. Um, I'm pretty fat and ugly and have an annoying voice if you want to learn how to drive cars faster. I'll give my channel a check out. I do uh, infotainment style content using simulators and post visor cam on boards whenever I get a chance to race in real life. So basically he's me, but he lives in Minnesota. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically American Austin Ogonoski. That's a scary thought. We, we, we are pretty similar people. Okay, raising the ride height fixed some of the stability issues. Wonder if the car was just like bottoming out just to cunt hair. Could be on the could be on the plank, yeah. Like not a lot for it to be noticeable, but just like in little spots here and there. Yeah, because now it, now it actually understeers in places it would oversteer. Uh, people in... Somebody in the chat, uh, the mad one, asked best advice about being a race car driver. Yeah, um... Don't treat it like a racing simulator. It's a lot harder. It's very expensive. It costs a lot of money and time. And the vast majority of your effort is going to be spent on just figuring out how to get licensed and get to the racetrack to begin with. So pick the cheapest, easiest, most accessible racing series possible to get into it first and take it super slow. Try track days or auto crossing or auto soloing or ice racing or something that isn't a fully prepared race car first at the local level. And don't feel bad if you don't like air quotes, make it. Um, there's a lot of amazing drivers who just stay at the amateur driving level and try to enjoy it and have as much fun as possible. You can get... You can be a pro-level driver who's racing amateur-level series just because you don't have enough uh, access to racetracks or money or you're in an area where there isn't a lot of racing. So don't beat yourself up about it. Try to find an affordable way to race as much as possible for as little money as possible is honestly my biggest piece of advice I can get. That's accurate. That's why I run many stocks. Okay, yeah, right height adjustment was necessary. I really wish I had a delta to see where I'm losing time. But I yeah, think I've got... Yeah, there's a lot of sims recently I've been getting into that don't have deltas or the delta isn't adjustable. Like AMS twos is based on your previous lap instead of your session best or overall best. No, That's there's useless. so there's a control, there's a button you can map to change it. Um, I didn't know you're okay. struggling with that because yeah, if you just click that button several times, it cycles between what the delta I, displays. I, I'm still trying to figure out how to get that thing to yeah. work. I really don't like the user interface. I feel like such a fucking boomer. Um, Sky will. Sky says if you're in Europe, start with carding. It's much cheaper, and you don't need a license. That's absolutely 100% true. If you're in the U.S., we don't have a lot of outdoor go karts, so I'd recommend starting with motorcycle racing, um, or uh, like auto crossing or time trialing instead of a fully prepped wheel to wheel race car. That's another way to try to get in it for cheap. You can buy something like a $1,500 clapped out like Mazda Miata or manual Ford Escort or Honda Civic, and auto cross it with your street car driving license and still race. 
Um, honestly, just try to find the easiest, lowest entry barrier way possible to get as much track time as you can. It's infuriating to watch Augie make successful back-to-back -back setup adjustments. Uh, honestly, this is just pure luck at this point. When I'm, like, really thrashing hard for AC, because I really want to try hard a race or a championship, it doesn't go this smoothly. Uh, Alexander in the chat asking, what's the seat, the racing scene look like on R-Factor 2? It's a good platform for an Insta League since they have all the modern cars and the on the racing department. Bring out the backup car. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I Jesus Christ, I just caught up to it. Fuck, that I could taste that one. That would hurt. <laughs> Stuff that in real good. Um uh, R Factor 2 has the same problem that Race Room does, uh, where it's a really good sim with some issues, so not as many people play it as the big ones like AC, ACC, and iRacing are kind of the biggest three right now. So you can find places to race, but you're gonna have to try decently hard to do so. Or at least I remember having to do so the last time I was using it. Um, the Link with Trail asks, Ted, since you're so traveled, what is your preferred sim right now? Uh, that's a really, really good, uh, question. I think it depends on your purposes. Uh, when I'm training a lot of my students who pay me for coaching, the vast majority of the people who pay me for coaching are utilizing iRacing because it has the largest kind of base of more serious people in sim racing right now. Uh, but in my opinion, the cost is expensive enough to justify doing real life racing instead of iRacing. So I wouldn't recommend getting that, especially if you're new to sim racing. I'd recommend getting something that's moddable and has a large user base and is decently accurate, even if it isn't perfect. Um, in my opinion, kind of ACC, AC, iRacing, Race Room Racing Experience, and R Factor 2, and, and currently now with the fixes, AMS 2 is getting there, are kind of like my top five or six, and they're all functionally interchangeable. You'll just have to figure out, you know, which kind of flavor of content you like, and they all have different issues. Um, just as a general rule, it's so cheap and there's so many leagues and mods available, I would recommend AC over all of those just because it's going to be the easiest to get into. Uh, and Lucas Lichten, endurance racing leagues exist on R-Factor 2, but Christ, the bugs you, were, you will encounter. That's coming from somebody who's an R-Factor 2 vet. Yeah, uh, the bugs are what keeps me out of R-Factor 2. I can't do a 40 minute to one hour long race without having the game crash on me at least one time uh, running VR uh, in, in my Oculus Quest or like a game breaking bug with a driver swap in an endurance race or something. R-Factor 2 is, is a good simulator. It feels good, but it just runs like scuffed dog shit. It's horrible. Sorry, Marcel, if you're watching. Yeah. Uh, Ted, how realistic are older games like IndyCar Racing 2, Grand Prix Legends, GTR 2, and NASCAR 2003? I can answer that. Um, yeah, Austin, you can answer that if you want to. Uh, my opinion is that they're pretty they're, they're pretty good, but they just miss some of the features that modern stuff does. Yeah. They don't model some things that they should. Um, if you can but, get IndyCar Racing 2 working with, with DOS box and wheel, like I have a problem with mine where it's flaky. Sometimes it recognizes my wheel and sometimes it just doesn't, so I'll go months without playing it. I love IndyCar Racing 2. It's a lot better than anyone presumes. There's a reason GP laps and guys like Ted Meat play it. But it does have iRacing's issue with low speed spins. Yeah, and to then GTR 2 has a problem where you can grip flick the car, kind of yeah. like AMS and AMS yeah. 2. Um, GPL is kind of like a little bit like a Seto Corsa where it's over for giving of sliding. Yeah. And they're also old at this point that they all have compatibility issues that make them very hard to use. You're, you're kind of a little bit better off just using the modern equivalent to that niche of sim, right? Like if you want to do vintage F1, go use a Seto Corsa. There are yeah. update patches for certain games. Like GPL has a huge like update wrapper yeah. where it's just like all the essentials you need it for Windows 10 to run in widescreen or ultra wide. It's there. Yeah, it is, but but it, it's a, it could be a little bit of a chore. Yeah. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, as somebody who primarily is a real life racing driver, and I use simulators for like work as a coach, just my own personal bias is if I have to spend ten fucking hours to get a racing sim to work for me, it's not worth me playing. Right? I need to be able to turn it on, have it detect my G twenty five, and work right now because a student called me ten minutes ago and needs coaching. Right? Yeah. So so. 
just my own personal bias is away from modding older sims to work on modern systems. That That is just me. Um, when you can get them working, they're okay. But like, I raced in like one GTR2 league a year or two ago that was mostly passionate guys who really love old super touring cars from the UK who were running the FRM mod, which was like, okay, yeah, sure, fine. But this, it got old after six weeks running the same cars, car mods on like a 15 year old game that hardly worked whenever I ran it. And uh, I've got a VR headset. Um, and then at my editing station, I got three monitors, but on my sim, I've only got a single monitor and they're all 18 inch monitors. So having to run that in, in, it on a single 18 inch monitor was just not fun after coming back from VR. I really, really enjoy using VR. The death of the no grip racing website or forum also sucks for a lot of older sims since that was where their communities were with fixes and mods and shit. Yeah, old forums like that going on definitely is not good. GTR2 has VR support if you use Crew Chief. Good for GTR2. Richard, how did you dial out the grip flick? Because that's something that plagues a lot of modern sims. That's a good question. I can't save ACC slides. Is that realistic? Um, it, you're gonna get to a certain point in those GT3 cars. The, the mid-engine rear-wheel drive GT3 cars in real life are a lot harder to drive than the front-engine rear-wheel drive cars. Because like I was talking about with Austin a little bit earlier on the stream while he was setting up this Indy car, even if they have a perfect 50-50 weight distribution, the rear tires being bigger than the front and the engine being in the back or the middle, bias towards the back side of the car means when the car starts to get away from you it gets very very hard to catch very quickly um there's a reason why there's all those jokes about you know people crashing porsche 911 rich old white men with gray beards crashing porsche 911s at track days their first time out right big heavy grand touring cars with huge wide tires that are very sensitive to being over or under driven will punish you very very hard if you make a mistake um I think ACC is a pretty appropriate in-between for how punishing iRacing's tires are and how over-forgiving Assetto Corsa's tires are. I think it's kind of at a nicer spot in-between that I think is a bit more accurate, uh, personally. Um, I say that as somebody who has crashed the ever-living shit out of a rear-engine spec racer Ford in real life, um, being the only really bad thing I ever had. But the, the way that you car. can... Yeah, the way you can get... Uh, a rear engine car into kind of like a long backslide in ACC, I think is pretty, pretty close. Uh, especially watching, um, especially watching onboards as some people drive and, and working with some people who race GT3 and GT4 cars in real life, I don't think it's that inaccurate at all. Okay, I'm going with uh, somewhat soft springs now. I can drive the Mercedes, so it makes sense. Yeah, if you're struggling with any of the cars in ACC, my honest-to-God biggest advice, drive something front-engine instead. It, it'll probably change your experience. Or don't don't drive a GT3 car. I actually think the GT4 cars are both more fun to drive and a little bit rewarding. More rewarding. They got less downforce, so they drive a little bit more like a street car on a track day and less like a kind of more modern race car. Someone asked if the stock NR03 physics are pretty good, and, and yes. NRO3 is really incredible what they've done with that game. Uh, I think the tires are a little too peaky once they get to a certain heat point, but for, for the most part, like every time I drove, I drove NRO3 and then jumped in like a real eight model, it was like this is identical. It was it was crazy. So I softened the springs, but left the ride height the same. It's already a little snappy on me, so ride height is important in this. After this, I want to go to a city track, for sure. 
Uh, interesting question in the comments. Uh, underrated racing series in real life. The Trans Am series deserves a shout out, especially since Ernie Francis Jr. has blown up since. Oh, you're gonna trigger uh, Ted. SRX. It's not gonna trigger me at all. Yeah, I do think that Trans Am is good, but Trans Am has the same problem that a lot of um, pro series in the U.S. have pro right now, which is the talent pool just isn't there because of Europe and the sponsorship isn't there. So a lot of the people who are racing long term, uh, their fathers are their team owner and, and own the race team, right? Which means, bluntly, you're not getting the best talent in those racing series. I mean, they, they, they are really cool, but I would prefer to ratchet Trans Am TA2 is where it's at. That's really closely and hotly contested, but Trans Am, the, the, the fact that they split TA2 from the races that have TA and TA3 and TA4 um, is indicative of the fact that some of the classes have a lot of car counts, others don't. I kind of wish that Trans Am would just merge the whole series into being TA2 only. Um, that's just me, though. Um, yeah, people do kind of sleep on modern Trans Am. VRC finally released a modern Trans Am TA2 car for uh, um, Assetto Corsa just a couple of days ago. Is it out yet? Um, it is. Yeah, and a whole bunch of people are reviewing it. I haven't bought it or tried it yet, uh, but it looks like it would probably be pretty fun. Uh, B Buddy five 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 says, "Wouldn't be the SCCA without twenty unnecessary car classes." I absolutely one hundred and ten percent agree. There's a reason why I switched to NASA racing. I really, really like NASA racing for my uh, my amateur racing uh, to stay fresh and keep my licenses now. And because the experience counts with the SCCA too, if I ever went back pro racing, I'd be like, hey, I got a NASA license. And a, a Pirelli World Challenge or Trans Am or whoever would give me my license anyway based on my NASA experience. So I kind of don't, I don't really see a reason to race in the SCCA with a super overcomplicated car class structure and the 900 page rule book versus, you know, NASA's 50 page one. Um, yeah, it, the only problem is just it's hard to find NASA tracks in the North Central. For example, I live in Minnesota right now, and Brainerd does not have any NASA-sanctioned races. All of their races are SCCA, Trans Am, Moto America, stuff like that, uh, SVRA, but no NASA. Well, I have to I have to haul a long way to get a race. Um, and Road America traditionally doesn't have a lot of... Uh, it, doesn't have any NASA races on any schedules. There's there's tracks, there's track politics going on where certain tracks are holdouts for certain racing organizations. This lap was really promising, but I think I just threw it away. And yeah, you're right. It This is rewarding smoother driving. A 120.7. Easily PB of the day. Holy fuck, almost died. The feeling of being on the edge of grip and what the arrow can do is awesome in this game. And the, the FFB is very similar to AC, where it's very smooth. And not very detailed, but there's just like tension on the wheel, if that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of does that thing where it like it kind of cushions you. It's just got a light pull the whole yeah. way through. Yeah, I like that. Who here watches Jimmy Broadbent in the Praga? Um, his fans who who like him and want to watch him race the Praga. I would assume. <laughs> no, you meanie. I'm not saying that to be mean at all. I just don't watch Jimmy Broadbent. I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I, do, I neither like nor dislike him. I am apathetic to, to Jimmy Broadbent. Yeah, I haven't I haven't been subbed to him in quite a while. There's a lot of streamers that I used to sub to because it was like that was the thing to do in sim racing. I, I really I really do genuinely prefer the small and medium sized guys. Like yeah. I, I really like the sim racing 604s, the GP laps. A couple of me and Austin sim racing friends got us in touch with each other because we both have smaller channels. Um, guys like Pro Sim Racing, like I would, I would much rather watch kind of those guys because when you're small, you have to try to do something unique to make you stand out. I complain about Minnesota. Try the West Coast. Yeah, try California, which has like six fucking racetracks in it. I, I would train Minnesota for that in a heartbeat because the problem with Minnesota is North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa also all have no racetracks. So I got Brainerd three hours away from me, and then the next closest thing to me is Road America, which is like six. So I have to go southeast to get tracks, and if I go west, there's nothing. Okay, we are going to go run IndyCar. Or, not oh, IndyCar, yeah. sorry, Street Circuit. This layout's awesome. Uh, south Shitty... 
yeah, South Shitty Chicane Route. All I've managed to do is volunteer as a marshal for Ojibwe Forest Rally. Yeah, but the Ojibwe Forest Rally is fun. There's also the, the, the track day events at DCTC and, like, all the Audi Club ice driving events. I sometimes coach those. You can come out to those. There's, there's stuff going on. Actually, in Minnesota, the Central Road Racing Association, our bike racing association, is getting, like, 200 riders now a year uh, across all their classes. They're doing super good. Which is one of the one of the impetus, one of the things that has driven the impetus behind me maybe considering a switch to bike racing. It's cheaper, it's more available, there's more tracks doing it, I don't need a trailer to haul a bike, and there's tons of people racing in it, even at the amateur level. Uh what do you think I should do hit. taking the West Hill setup? I would take it and then I'd just honestly put a shorter final in it and pretty much yoke the wings out, maybe raise it a little bit. Should, it shouldn't. It shouldn't need a ton. Okay, of we're running into a first problem now. Is I can't save it as a different setup. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So can I like copy and paste a set? Dylan, you live in Ohio, so apart from Mid Ohio, there's basically nothing. Hey, man, I would rather have Mid Ohio than Brainerd as my only track. I'm not gonna lie. Actually, I went to Kansas for my only amateur race last year, and I got to drive Heartland Park, Topeka, Kansas, or Heartland Motorsports Park, whichever you want to call it. That's actually a banger of a racetrack. That one's really good. I would love to live in that kind of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio crescent. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff nearby. Okay, you know what? It takes your last setup, so whatever the values you had in there, so that's not bad. Then, uh, good. Street good. Circuit, you so you used. get a new... You get a new shock package, uh... How quickly do I want the front end to come up? Not very quickly. Uh, final drive, yeah, it needs a shorter final drive. It's probably going to be like... Honestly, I'm going to run like a 7. Because I know this, this track's pretty short, and I'm, I'm familiar with racing here. So, we'll see. Instant load times, that's awesome. Fuck, that's a corner complex. I need more gear. Just a bit. I mean... That looks pretty spot on to me. The, the gearing? Yeah. This is kind of like an improved version of Metal Lands. It's really simple. Yeah. Uh, two things in the chat I want to address. Uh, B Buddy saying road racing in Europe is less expensive. That's why everyone in the U.S. is sponsored by their dad. Not incorrect. The density of tracks and the availability of series makes it a lot cheaper. And sponsors are a lot more willing to spend money on you if you can do 30 races a year instead of 10 for the same amount of money. Um, and then somebody else saying, Bike racing puts more of a risk on your body. If you fall off a bike, it's going to hurt a lot. Yeah, not incorrect. That's okay. I don't I don't have any problem with that. As long as I don't end up permanently disabled, I'm totally fine with getting injured bike racing or or even dying bike racing. Like you know, cuz I'm in my mid 20s and my pro racing career has already gone tits up one time and now I'm instructing instead, which is great. I really like being a driving instructor, but like 
you know, I'm not getting any younger, 23 years old right now, and, and I would quite like to do professional level racing again. So if the bikes are cheaper and I could do more racing on them for less money, I, I am more than willing to risk getting hurt or even dying doing so. It's, uh, it's not a problem to me. If one is ruining street circuits, just look at the Saudi Arabia race. Yeah, Saudi Arabia race was a fantastic circuit. Um, but F1 uh, clearly has some kind of really weird issue with uh, the calls being made in race control this season. And the reason why the, the F1 is going towards street circuits so much is because politically it's more convenient for them to appeal to a younger, richer audience to be inside the middle of a city than it is to have a new racetrack built in a rural area outside of the city. Yeah, India, the... What's that track called? It's got a funny name. The India yeah. Circuit that was Bud. built out in the middle of nowhere. Bud, 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 Bud yep. B -B -H. yeah. Like Ankh, but with a B. This layout is awesome. I'm having so much fun right now. That looks really cool. You come screaming into turn one. You can't see turn one. Have you considered doing Dirt Oval, Ted? There's at least two Dirt Ovals within an hour of me and Grad Rapids and Hibbing. Yeah, I was actually... Um, um, top five in the Dirt Oval State Championships in Minnesota several years in a row uh, back in the early 2010s, and I got fourth at uh, Dirt Oval Nationals in a Legends car one year. I, I really liked Dirt Oval racing, um, but uh, back when... Uh, back when... Uh, it's kind of complicated, but back when uh, my father died and his life insurance money was being run through my mother to pay for my racing, she was also advocating for me to teams. Um, and she didn't really know anything about being a manager for a young race car driver. So I had uh, some issues with the local Legends car dealer and a couple of oval tracks uh, because of the way my family handled some stuff on my behalf. Um, so going back to oval racing here would probably not be an option. And I've already got a road racing car and a trailer and a truck all set up for that. So I would, I would lose a ton of money and time to switch around and change car classes back to doing dirt oval stuff. Also, to be fully honest, mechanically, I did a two-year mechanics apprenticeship, but I admit I'm really bad at working on cars. I can just mostly do the basics. So the fact that it's so easy to prep and maintain a racing bike is really attractive uh, to me. Yeah, that's a lot of something a lot of people don't remember. Like, unless you find someone who's willing to work on their car or on your car for you, which I have with mine, you have to start thinking about like okay like if something if something gets broken because like you wreck in racing it happens right are you able to fix it yeah and that's one of the problems with running production based cars like doing my Porsche spec 944 right got to think about it the car was made in like 1984 yep i'm not going to be able to go to a junkyard and pull a fucking gearbox out of it it's why people like racing homologation specials like legends cars or spec racer fords that have a parts supplier yeah. because even if it's expensive more expensive to race a car class like that boom you can always car call the like 600 racing and get a new legends car frame you can always find a shock absorber you can always find yep. a gearbox you can always find an engine and, and the thing with racing bikes is when you're new you start off in in either super super stock or or showroom spec classes where you're literally just throwing an oil pan on the on the bike maybe some cooling your electrical cut off and and safety wiring all the fluid cap shot and then you're running basically a street stock bike so it's there is almost no like I, I've been hung up for years. I've got two spec 944s. I have one that's still not finished to this day because I didn't know how to weld a cage on it. I don't know how to do the fab work to, to change it to new front control arms because I'm running a kind of front control arms that apparently is prone to failure. So you need custom ones or to make your own for it to be legal to race. Like there's all kinds of issues. Um, You know, there's a lot of different considerations and stuff like that. Yeah, a little dumb shit. Yeah, just tiny things that you'll get hung up on for a long amount of time. Killed the car. Uh, I have a problem with the left rear overheating. Yeah, it does. And I need some gear in it. Uh, somebody asked, are we talking Isle of Man TT style racing or like MotoGP style racing? I would probably start be starting off racing on circuits in the United States. Ideally, my long term goal is I would actually quite like to do public bike road racing in the UK if I ever move there. Um, but my, my current plan is to get something like a, a, a Yamaha R3 or a KTM 390 
um, and race it in a, basically a showroom stock class in amateur AMA racing series, and then get my upgrade to a pro, pro license, and then maybe do their uh, their junior cup for riders ages 14 to 28 on the 400cc class bikes. Um, and if, if it's going well and I'm not losing a ton of money or I'm having a lot of fun, maybe then work up to the stock the stock one liter bike class from there and uh, continue doing circuit racing on bikes. Uh, Dylan Hale, 65,000 to 85,000 for a NASCAR Euro car and 125 to 150 for a TA2 car. That is correct. And the last time I was talking to teams about doing a TA2 race last year, it was $25,000 for a single weekend what as an fuck? arrive and drive rental racer. And the teams were all basically agreeing to charge all drivers the same price. So there's some price fixing going on in that series between teams. So you can't really get less for anybody. Um, from anybody. I talked to three or four different teams about it, and they all said twenty to 25000 Yeah, and the, and the thing that a lot of European people don't understand is the U.S. doesn't have something like the Genetta GT5 Junior Cup where you can earn a scholarship available. It doesn't have the Ford Ka One Mate Club Cup. We don't have a Renault Clio Cup. We, we don't have semi pro semi pro or high level amateur series or amateur level series that reward you by allowing you to continue driving for free or for reduced cost or moving up or getting like a sponsorship or put into a driver development academy Okay, you're gonna say something you've thought of for a while. Mo more vehicle, more vehicle oval racing series. There's IndyCar, NASCAR. Where's the motorcycle oval series and so on? Uh, there is, a there yeah, there is AMA flat track motorcycle. Yes. Yeah. Flat track and there's speedway racing in Europe, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and to put this in perspective, guys, there's a lot of guys say saying uh, like like wow, they didn't realize how expensive racing is. You gotta think about it. My amateur club level race car was a seventy five hundred dollar car. I get charged five hundred to a thousand dollars for a tech inspection every year to make sure it's still safe. My tires are two hundred dollars each, and I use one every one or two week a, a new set every couple of weekends. The fuel racing fuel is five dollars a gallon. My license renewal is two hundred dollars every year. Right, my entry fees are five hundred to a thousand dollars. So, so basically, if I want to do an amateur racing series for a club level amateur racing series in the U.S., because the tracks are so far apart, doing one race weekend where I had to tow eight hours in one direction to get to a racetrack, just the travel cost alone was something like fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars. After I had the car and the truck and the trailer, which was you know fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So, so it, it really stacks up really quick. Um, a, a lot of the times, low-level pro series in Europe do end up being cheaper than, than amateur series in the U.S. just simply based on how high the travel costs and times are here alone very often. You know about flat tracks. You mean a true banked oval motorcycle racing series? Yeah, you can't really run motorcycles yes. on high bank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that that does not exist for for very good reasons. You've noticed that you, me, and Austin have different opinions on various sims and their realism. You think the kind of cars you race in real life can affect your opinion on what's realistic in sims. I mean, yeah. Everybody's That's pretty astute. Have, yeah, I like that. Yeah, everybody's going to have a different experience base. It's like if you were watching if you were watching a stream where it was two different lawyers and one of them was a self-defense lawyer and the other one was a public yep. defendant criminals. They're going to have different opinions on the law, right? Yep. Me and him have vastly different experiences. I have different experiences and techniques and ideas from all the other professional coaches I talk to and work with on a weekly basis too um there is not there is not one universal opinion on this and it's you know the usage of simulators what they're good for what they're bad for what they're good at and bad at and how air quotes realistic they are as a percentage is a constant debate in the racing world always always will be 
Mad Thunder race the R3. It's less expensive. If you can race a Kawasaki 300, that'd be better too. Yep. The idea is to race a Yamaha R3 in my club level races and then get a Ninja 400 for AMA uh, Juniors Cup because the Ninja 400 is the most competitive bike in that class and basically everybody's running it. So hopefully one year on the amateur 300cc bike, probably a Yamaha, and then I'll get a Ninja 400 uh, Juniors Cup bike for AMA Pro Racing. Um, and then that's basically prepped the same way as like a Moto like a Moto 3 or a, or a 390 class uh, Euro Pro bike would be. Oh yeah, people mentioning board track racing. Yeah, that shit's suicidal. A good point pointed out by Dylan. Uh, basically, there is no ladder system in the U.S. because every sanctioning body is separate. The tracks are too far away from, from one another, and there's zero parity between sanctioning bodies. Yes, yep. absolutely correct. Even in short track oval racing, like a mini stock yeah. here in Edmonton is not the same as a mini stock in B.C. Yeah, there's there's IROC, there's NASCAR, there's each different track is actually going to have its own individual track rule set in oval racing. Yep. And then in row racing, you've got IMSA versus IndyCar versus Grand Am versus SCCA versus NASA versus yep. Grid Lifer. I mean, like, it's the same problem that sim racing public matchmaking systems happen. If instead of WSS and SRS and RSR and Track Titan existing, there was only one system for race booking in AC, everybody would be able to get a race all the time. But they yep. all screwed each other over by competing with one another. US racing has the same problem. There is no single governing body like the FIA's control over European racing. Um, because in, in Europe, it's pretty much you have your international series governed by the FIA, and then your local stuff is run by, like, your, your your you know, uh, what is it called? The GBDRC, the Great British Racing Drivers Club or whatever. And other than that, there is no other sanction. In the U.S., we have a huge problem with too many different sanctioning bodies and rules and stuff. Uh, I have a theory. Like, this app's pretty good, but it's not reactive on corner entry it doesn't cut in the, the amount i need it to look a little bit sluggish you try well, turning the caster up so i'm thinking either caster or big bar set big bar? Just, what about yeah. what about toe what about just getting the front tires working a bit better because you said the rears were overheating and it looks like it's it looks like the understeer is coming from the front to me okay so something like that hey yeah negative neg uh, negative two tenths in the front positive two in the rear that sounds about right yeah uh yeah um i'm gonna try big bar so let's do what's it go up to holy shit 300 um let's do like 120 and like two something 240 i probably shouldn't be making too many adjustments like this at once but like we have unlimited backup cars so we can do that yeah because like i would notice going into turn one it just wouldn't rotate at all and i'm like well it's good because it's not breaking loose but like be better so we'll see if this works it's still running uh, super soft springs to soak up the bumps but like damn this track's awesome and there's like five or six different layouts of it too I just like this one because it's really fast again it's like metal lands oh, big test that seems a little better, yeah. So I've been in the 55s for most of the laps here. Yeah, good point. Somebody said, isn't there not like three or four different spec Miata series in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. as far as I know, Indy, IndyCar runs the Pro Series that use the current the current ND Cup car, which has two different cars available, one with a sequential gearbox and one with not, that technically aren't the same class. NASA has the spec MX-5 challenge, which uses old NC generation Miatas, and then there's also a spec Miata SCCA class and a spec Miata NASA class, so... Oh, I forgot AER. Good job, buddy. Me, daddy, five, 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 five. Yeah, I totally forgot AER. Yeah, I mean, like people, you know, I I understand that it might be hard for people to relate to to 
the frustration of a guy like like uh, me me or Austin but if you're living in the wrong part of the US there's a reason why all the only pros in the US are all Mexican Puerto Rican or come out of like California which has like six racetracks right if you're in the wrong spot you just don't have access to enough tracks enough driving time enough racing uh, I really am genuinely heavily considering moving to Europe in the next three to five years uh, if, if you know while I'm still young enough to try to take a shot at pro racing uh, uh, Zigag, uh, a different NASA, not the kind that la launches rockets. There's one called the National Auto Sport Association. It's a, it's a racing club, like the SCCA. Oh, Dylan Hale, there's also the SVRA MX-5 spec class. Yep, but only for NA Miatas, because they're old enough to be vintage now. Yeah, it's just the whole thing's a shit show. Not only that, but the prices for some of the spec classes, like spec Miata, are starting to get totally out of control. Championship winning spec Miatas in, in SCCA have motors built by Penske and cost like $55,000 now. Used. P people are selling used national championship podium spec Miatas for like forty to $50,000. Um, the, the costs are totally, completely out of control. There we go. There's a, there's a 54. There you go. Yeah, I can actually underdrive it now because it rotates so well and it goes quicker, yeah. which is there you go. accurate, right? Just need a bit of that toe. Toe and the sway bar is like, I, I'm entering this, like, this uphill right-hander section coming up. I'm yeah. entering it less aggressive and I'm going quicker because it just well, rotates car, so well. The car just kind of driving itself now. Yeah. That lets me tuck into that right side wall earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dylan, I, I agree. Uh, we need some kind of single sanctioning body overseeing all of amateur racing in America. It'd be really great. Uh, it's just... You know, it really sucks. It's, it's one of the reasons why I want to switch to bike racing. You want to race bikes in the U.S., you're under the AMA banner. They've got local AMA... They've got local clubs but they all run AMA rules. And then you take your amateur bike and you just go pro race it in Moto America. That's it. There's nothing, right? So insanely easy. And then you know people are like, oh, why is why is nobody young getting into racing? Why 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 is racing dying in the U.S.? Because you're bankrupting the the drivers who come out and put on the show. And, and it's basically like an can't... expensive hobby at this point. Yeah, exactly. It, it really, really is. Even for all like the air quotes pro drivers in U.S. racing, they're they're not making money. Nobody's running at a profit. Wow. That's pretty fun. Uh, can I watch a replay? Yeah. I cannot. It was not being recorded. Okay. Uh, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Uh, so let's actually take a look at what they did that was different, because it doesn't take a whole lot longer to load sets. Because this is, this is kind of the point we were making in one of our podcast episodes, where we said like default sets are setting people up for failure. Yep. So we'll compare it to West Hill because that's more or less what this setup is based off of. So we'll go with the road track, which is the default road course config if you get this car just off like the modding. Uh, what's it called? The modding, I don't want to call it storefront, but just the modding thing. Just the mod page. Yeah. So the default set and our arrow is com basically the same. It didn't change anything there. That's kind of neat. You can actually see like the ride height change as you flip between the cars. So then we go to tires. Uh, the road track, uh, 20 PSI on both ends of the car. Camber, we ended up like cutting it in half basically because the car was over cambered. So like there wasn't, from what I'm thinking, there wasn't even enough tire touching the ground because it was just so like 
so aggressive. And basically from a handling characteristic standpoint, when you reduce the amount of camber, the car doesn't cut into corners as well. But in this case, that was a good thing because the car was over-rotating pretty much all the time. So in reducing the camber, not only did it stabilize tire, tire temperatures and make the, the tires overheat less, but like it was more predictable to drive because you would turn into a corner and it didn't just immediately snap and try and kill you. So that's one issue that the default set fucked up on. Uh, final drive, it didn't even get into fifth gear. The car has six gears. It was only going to fourth. So we had to change all of that. So as we switched to our, our you know custom set, the final drive was totally different. Not to mention, and this is something someone pointed out in our comments, the, the diff values were backwards. Where the, the default car, uh, or the default loadout, had 30 power, 60 coast, and then Richard in our chat was like, actually, these cars in real life, because he's got some setup sheets for some of the uh, the cart mods he's worked on for Automobilista, he's like, actually, you know, they ran 60 power and 30 coast. So, like, the diff, the diff was backwards, and that is going to completely change how the car drives on corner entry and on corner exit, because, like, as you lift off the power going into a corner and then apply power on exit, the wheels are going to spin at different speeds, and that'll upset you know, the, the balance of the car, because your rear end, the tires aren't turning at the same rate, right? I think I, I think I explained that somewhat adequately. So that, that alone, like, was like a massive difference. I know when Richard suggested that, and we just tried it at West Hill, it was like night and day. Uh, over to steering, uh, caster was at six, the toe wasn't aggressive enough, for a mid-engined car. So typically, like in a mid-engined car, to, to, to get the alignment to work with basically the pendulum effect that happens when the engine's located in the rear, you want to run more aggressive rear toe. So like that alone, that's going to stabilize the car mid-corner, would you say? Yeah. Uh, entry, entry, and coming in, because the back isn't going to want to be turning as much. It's going to want to naturally be going straight. So you basically use the, the toe to catch the car mid-corner. Mm -hmm. And the default set just didn't have that. Then we go to suspension. This is like, we did everything different here. Uh, the default ride height, the car sits way too low. So in any sort of mid to high speed corner, I think the car was actually compressing and bottoming out. I just couldn't feel it under the force feedback. So one of the first things I did was raise the ride height a whole bunch so it sits higher uh, spring stiffness the springs by default were too stiff not by a whole lot but by a little bit you basically want for any sort of like open wheel car or just cars in general you want it to always soak up the bumps of a track you would basically only run a stiff setup at like a perfectly smooth track you basically set the spring so they soak up the bumps relative to, to the racing surface and then you also try and factor in a bit of like car handling into it. So like if the front's stiffer than the rear, the front's gonna, the car's going to understeer, which is kind of what you want in an in indie car, because you're going to get so much assistance from the wings to turn the car that it's better to dial out a cunt or it's better to dial in a cunt hair of understeer so the car's neutral through the corner. But for for whatever reason, this just wasn't in the setup. And again, the springs are too stiff, which makes the car. I think what he tried to do is, because he ran the ride height low, he stiffened the car to compensate, to prevent it from bottoming out, but he didn't get all the way done with that. So it was just like scraping, and, and it was just messy. Uh, bump and rebound damping. Uh, basically, his rebound sets in the rear set you up for failure. I've mentioned this throughout the stream, that like an easy fix if the car is unloading on corner exit, and you find like when you apply on the power and center the wheel, the rear end just snaps. That's That's a, a shock thing. Most of the time, there's a different. There's a couple different ways, and you, you've probably dealt with this too. Just making setups. There's a couple of ways you can deal with the car unloading on exit, but like if you just want to get the track, get you know, get to the track and not spin off the exit every single time, you should run really low rebound damping, so the rear end doesn't come up and, and the load shift that violently because that's what causes the car to spin. So the default setup had had rebound damping at six, when it probably should have been basically at minimum, or as close to minimum as possible before it's just like chronic understeer. Uh, the front 
same thing. I don't really understand what he's trying to do by having the, the front end come up too quickly, or that quickly, I should say. On top of that, in open wheel cars, you typically run the, the front end of the car, just everything related to suspension and just travel, like like springs, like, like shocks, like uh, uh, anti-roll bar. You basically want to run that all stiff, and he had it way too soft. Like, bump damping for the front is at a minimum, where we cranked it up by, like, triple the amount. And the same thing really goes for the roll bars. Uh, you typically want to run a big bar set, or how should I explain this better? You typically want to invert whatever you've done with the springs. You want to do the inverse with these the sway bars. So if you're on a really soft sprung car, which we're doing here with, uh, I believe it's 60 newton meter, meter uh, springs in the front, you basically want to crank that the fuck up when it comes to the sway bar. And then, of course, the inverse is also true, which is what a lot of NASCAR teams did back in the day. Uh, NASCAR teams, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, they'd run super stiff springs, like a 2,000 pound right front spring, and then these little tiny sway bars. And then I think it was Richard Childress and a couple other teams found out that if you did the opposite, you would just fly, which is why uh, Kevin Harvick won in 2001 at Atlanta. That was talked about on the Dale Jr. download. But basically, yeah, you just want to invert what you're doing up front based on the spring stiffness and sway bar stiffness. Uh, he doesn't really do any of that. He runs kind of the same stiffness all around, so I don't really know what he's trying to accomplish there. Again, I'm not ripping on the guy who made this mod because at the end of the day, we did get it feeling pretty good, and I was really enjoying my laps. But it just shows that, like, 15 minutes in the in the garage area can mean all the difference between, like, a pretty good mod and a pretty bad mod. So, yeah, just everything we ran setup-wise was completely different. Brakes? Brakes are the only thing I didn't change. I didn't feel the need to adjust the balance at all. Maybe in a league format, if I was really pushing, I would fuck with the balance just a bit. But, yeah. other than that, like, fuck, I had to change everything. Yeah. It, the harder the... The harder... The faster the car is, the the more dependent it is on, on downforce. Almost invariably, every sim, modded content, official content, or otherwise, the shittier the default baseline setup gets. Yep. And it's weird, too, because, like, you would think guys who mod or make mods for racing sims would, would like, know some of this stuff, right? They you don't. don't. You'd be surpri you'd be surprised yeah. how little they know. Like, like don't forget, especially shit like ACC. There's people just ripping old GPL and R Factor mods and kind of tweaking the setups, the 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 physics a little bit, and then being like, "Oh, this is a new mod now." Ooh. It's like, uh, right? Like, and then that's not necessarily what this guy did for live for speed, especially because, you know, I don't know if 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 there's a propensity to rip mods in live for speed like there is in Assetto Corsa. That I'm just giving an example of, you know, there's a lot of yeah. mods out there that a lot of people use, and the people making them don't know what the fuck they're doing at all. Makes me very sad. Because, yeah, like, I mean, that that fuels a lot of the tribalism between games, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I drove this in this sim, and it handled, like, diarrhea dookie waffle. Oh, and it's like, well, you fucking fix the baseline setup. And yep. people would actually be able to tell what's the modeling of the program and what's the limitation of the fact that the car drives like dicks by default, you know, like, I don't know. And, don't and then know. sometimes even when you do get the setup right, it still does like janky shit. Yeah. I don't think that was all that bad though. I mean, I don't know, Austin, I, I'm not going to watch any of your YouTube videos because you use the word janky to describe how a car was handling. That was, that was my, that was my favorite underrated comment this year. That had to be a good one. My, 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 my favorite was the person who, found the first episode of our podcast, watched it, and then left a comment on, why Why am I seeing a podcast featuring a piece of shit like Ted Ho and my recommendations on YouTube? Based. That's like, I don't know, maybe if you didn't leave a comment, the video wouldn't do so well. Thank you. <laughs> what's what's um, default content in this game? Because if you click car, you get a list of cars. Uh, I do not where's know. Where's the VW Sirocco? So I thought that was supposed to be in the game. Soroko. Jesus Christ. Dude, I am I am very obviously not educated. Shirocco. Thank you. So a mini uh I guess that'd be like an MG Metro, an yeah, early gen it. RX seven. Yep, Couple, some Katrum style yep. things. A fake some Supra. JDM, fake Supra, some JDM bro gay boy cars. 
Uh, Another RX-7. Yeah. Uh, uh, convertible I don't care for. That would be like a Carrera or some sort of Porsche. Oh, I get how this is split. It's street cars in the top and then race cars in the bottom. So a mini race car, a MG Metro race car. Yeah, what appears like to be a DTM car, maybe? But like early 2000s uh, DTM. Because if this like was 2003. kind of thing. Yeah. I want to say the XR GTR would be like FIA GT1. But like... Or even like a Super GT car, because that's an RX-7. And then, okay, and then your GTR would be a GT1 spec car. Yeah. Okay, Sky's saying the VW was vaporware. That It was like a meme about the game. Like, when's the VW coming? And it was like some shit hatchback. Then you have, this is pretty cool, you have a, a Formula SAE student car. Mm. Uh, Formula BMW, which is a series that I don't even think is around anymore. But back in the yeah. early 2000s, it was huge. Uh, Formula 3? Yeah. Formula V8, which, what the fuck would that be? Probably a Formula 5000 car. Okay. And then, uh, BMW Sauber F106, that's a cool fucking car. That car was in a lot of Sims back in the day. Yeah, Anyways. Not just about anybody. I, I think I'm done for now. I'm gonna go to the bathroom and, and live like a normal person for a small amount of time, and then I might stream iRacing later with my buddy. I do want to clip the segment where I went through this car setup, though, because I just want to show people like how how insane, insanely different, like a default set is or a bad default set is versus you know like an actual proper loadout. Maybe I'll get in touch with this guy too and be like, make this the default set. Anyway, thank you for coming out, people. Until next time. And thank you, Mr. Ted, for joining me on my fabulous journey of testing the IndyCar. Thank you, Mr. No Sky, problem. for being a mod. We should probably get yeah. Sky in here next time, because Sky's, Sky's really good to talk to. Yeah, you just chill out and chat shit about sim racing. It was, it was better to have you driving than other people to read the chat. I think yeah. it worked pretty well. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you for coming out, everybody. I hope you have fun and stay safe. Don't let anybody cough on you. Um, for people, I saw a couple of people asking about Sim Racing Rejects. We're trying to get back on schedule. We took a week off so that we could release the first Monday of the new year on January 3rd. Um, so that the, the podcasts are always the first and third week of the month.